Good evening everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Ultrasound of the Neonatal Head and Spine. My name is Claire and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. The webinar is scheduled to run for approximately 60 minutes and will be recorded. For the benefit of everyone, the conference line has been muted for all participants. We will open up for questions in the last 10 minutes. Please note, if you do have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them via the questions pane on your control panel and they will be answered at the end. Cheryl Rogerson is a consultant neonatologist at the Royal Women's Hospital Melbourne and a lecturer with the University of Melbourne. She has been involved in ultrasound scanning of neonates for over 20 years. Her passion for ultrasound found her working in Malawi for four years using ultrasound as a part of the care of patients and teaching point of care ultrasound scanning. She has her DDU and is a founding board member of the neonatal CCPU and has been teaching on the courses for eight years. She has published on ventricular dilation and long-term outcomes, the cerebellum and on point of care echocardiography. Thank you so much for your time today, Cheryl. I'll now hand the webinar over to you. Um, thank you very much, Claire. Um, thank you for everyone for dialing in at this late hour. It's really exciting to be talking about neonatal head and spine ultrasound. I'm Cheryl Rogerson, but first I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues, Lisa Fox, Grant Foster and Caroline Garlick, who have also participated and providing me with some slides. The outline of the talk will be the anatomy and the windows for the cranial ultrasound scan, gyral development, interventricular hemorrhage, the posterior fontanelle pathology, extra axial bleeds, spinal ultrasound scans and pathology. An acoustic window is for the optimal imaging of the neonatal brain. It requires a good ultrasound window, which includes mainly the non-fused cranial sutures of the fontanelle. We have the anterior fontanelle, which is here, the mastoid fontanelle, the posterior fontanelle, the sphenoid and the frenum magnum. And we'll also talk about getting views of the spine and the brain stem through the frenum magnum. The anatomy. It's really important to remember that your ultrasound window is actually over the posterior frontal lobe. And the central gyrus and the sulcus and the postcentral gyrus is behind your actual ultrasound probe. The parietal lobe is more parietal, is more posterior than you generally think. And then we have the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, the pons, and the medulla. Cutting through the center of the brain, we have the corpus callosum, we have the cerebrum, we have the massa intermedia, we have the third ventricle, the pons, the medulla, the fourth ventricle, the vestigial point of the fourth ventricle, which is used quite extensively for measuring the cerebellum and the cerebellum height and vermal height. Um, we have the parieto occipital sulcus, the occipital lobe. So putting this into where is the area of pathology when we see periventricular lesions and parenchymal lesions, this is anterior frontal in the sagittal plane, this is posterior frontal, so below your actual ultrasound probe is the posterior frontal area. Behind that is the parietal, then we have occipital, temporal and then the thalamus. This will become a little bit more clearer as we go through some of the slides. Routine scanning of the neonate is generally done in different ways, but this is a proposed way for the Australian system. We tend to try and do a scan in the first one to three days, then at seven to ten days, and then at 28 days, and then monthly until discharged. If the children are 28 weeks or less, are 28 weeks but less than 32 weeks, we just tend to do one in the first week and then monthly afterwards. After an infant is 32 weeks gestation, the indications for cranial ultrasound scan are purely clinical. Interventricular hemorrhage and the periventricular echogenicity and periventricular leukomalacia really does not occur in infants, the standard general well infant after 32 weeks. The standard scanning planes, you generally do five coronal, five sagittal, a mastoid fontanelle view, and then there's further optional images. Coming into play now is most people are looking at the cerebellum and looking for cerebellar hemorrhages, so they measure the transcerebellar diameter, 
and there are published guidelines as to the cerebellar diameter in relation to gestation. And this is frequently used when people aren't sure of the gestation of an infant. Many people measure the anterior artery resistive index. Some people measure the middle cerebral artery resistive index. And then there is measuring of the ventricle width and ventricular measurements looking at the anterior horn width, the thalamoccipital distance, is now actually being really heavily researched and in using ultrasound to determine the long-term outcome for a particular infant. So really trying to get their long-term outcome away from these are the percentages, trying to actually individualize a person's long-term outcome. And there's more and more research being done on ultrasound, serial ultrasound measurements being used to determine an individual's long-term outcome. The coronal scan, the anterior fontanelle, as we've seen, is a diamond shape. And the beam is, set, is swept from the orbit through to the posterior area, through to the occipital lobe. Conventionally, the right side of the patient is displayed on the left side of the screen, and the beam is swept anterior to posterior. So this is a 30-week infant in the coronal plane. We're looking here at the, at the um, insular mechanical guide. This is the interhemispheric fissure, the lateral ventricle. This is the root of the third ventricle with the coral plexus in the third ventricle. This is the thalamus the cave and septum lucidum, this is the insula, and this is the hippocampal gyri. So you generally sit anterior to frontally. So this is the anterior frontal lobe. So you're looking at the orbits here, the roof of the orbits, and these are the two frontal lobes of the interhemic fissure. Then you go to the next plane, which is at the level of the thalamus. You have the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles should not really be completely visible. You have a little bit of the corpus callosum, and you have the start of the sylvian fissure. You then go back to the level of the circle of Willis. So you will see pulsation here from the middle cerebral artery. If you put color Doppler on, cavum septum pellucidum, and you're starting to now look at the temporal lobe. Then you go further back, and you're at the level of the basilar artery. You have the cavum septum pellucidum. The chordate nuclei, which is this inferior circular area at the base, inferior margin of the lateral ventricles. And you have the echogenic brainstem, pons, and medulla. Then you go back further to the level of the cerebellum. And you tend to have the three-dot sign, which is the choroid plexus and the roof of the third ventricle, the insula, and then you have the choroid fissures. So the choroid fissures are the joining plates of the choroid into the inferior margin of the lateral ventricles. You have the vermis of the cerebellum, and you have a little bit of the cisterna magna. Then you keep going back further, and you're looking at the tentorium. You must remember that you're sloping back now from the anterior fontanelle. And in fact, your ultrasound beam is going from the cerebellum up towards the tentorium. You have the quadrigeminal plate cistern, the cerebellum, and the bodies of the lateral ventricles. You're not out, coming up now to the periventricular white matter. You're having the choroid plexus, which is in the atria of the ventricles, and the occipital lobe, just above the tentorium. And then you go as far back as possible so that you can define that there is no cystic periventricular leukomalacia. The sagittal plane is done also through the anterior fontanelle, and it's at 90 degrees to the coronal plane. The beam is swept through the intracranial structures laterally to the right and to the left of the midline. That is the parasagittal plane, and this is the true sagittal plane. Images are taken to show comparable planes on each side. So this is the sagittal midline. This is the corpus callosum. This is the cingulate sulcus. This is the corpus callosum. This is the cerebellar vermis, so you've got your superior vermis, the vestigial point of the fourth ventricle, and your inferior vermis. You have the cavum septum pellucidum, evident here, fourth ventricle. So this is the parasagittal view. And for the parasagittal view, it's really important to remember that the ventricles don't run parallel 
to the interhemispheric fissure. They run at a slight angle that is going from, for, for the um, right ventricle, it's going from the midline a little bit more laterally to the right. So when you're sweeping out to get the parasagittal view, you need to move the posterior part of your probe just a little bit more lateral than the anterior part of your probe. And you will see the lateral ventricle at the frontal horn, you'll see the occipital horn, you'll see the atria, you'll see the periventricular white matter, which is particularly important in neonates looking for periventricular echogenicity and periventricular leukomalacia. You'll see the caudate nucleus, which is outlined by a thin, more echogenic rim, and it's an inferior semicircular um, structure in the inferior margin of the lateral ventricle. You'll see the choroid plexus. You'll see the temporal lobe. Then you go right out to the lateral, as far lateral as you can, and you'll get the chandelier view. Sometimes what you need to do to get this view is to move further in the um, anterior fontanelle to the opposite side so that you can get the beams to sweep to the um, sylvian fissure to get this sort of chandelier sign. The cordothalamic groove is actually here, so here's the caudate nucleus, here's the thalamus, and then you see this is the germinal matrix which is noted within the cordothalamic groove. It's the one of the most important areas, you really want to know how much echogenicity there is, and sometimes you need to do a little bit of a medial and oblique angulation to actually get the cordothalamic groove in display. The next thing is to look at the cerebral pulse waves and the anterior cerebral artery. So you place the Doppler and you should trace out the um, Doppler waveform and the active index should be somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8. The pericolosal artery, that's your anterior cerebral artery. Then coming in is your basilar artery. This is looking at the circle of Willis. So this is your right middle cerebral artery because the image is labelled showing that we're now imaging through the right mastoid fontanelle view. There are the anterior cerebral arteries. This is part of the brainstem, the cerebral preduncles. And this is the left middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery. You do a pulse spectral Doppler through the middle cerebral artery. And that is also helpful looking at the resistive index, which we will go through late in further slides. If you've got very low blood flow, you can often see very nice pictures of low blood flow by turning on the pulse Doppler, and you can define where your arteries are and their width and their size. The corpus callosum, and then you're going into the cavum septum pellucidum, the pericolosal artery, and the marginal callosal artery and the anterior cerebral artery. So these become more clear in pulse Doppler because sometimes in the very preterm infant it's very low velocity flow. This is an area of an area infant of with a raised intracranial pressure and as you can see this is an abnormal spectral Doppler for an infant. So you have forward flow in systole and then reversed flow in diastole and this is consistent with quite significant raised intracranial pressure. Factors that change the waveform, an increased resistive index is due to increased vascular resistance that reduces flow during diastole, which is what we've just seen, raised intracranial pressure. Uh, the patent ductus arteriosus is also steals blood from the carotids if it's very large, and you can get absent end diastolic flow in the anterior cerebral artery. Um, intracranial processes such as hemorrhages, edema, and hydrocephalus. And if the operator puts pressure on the transducer, um, you can often induce reversed flow. And that is also suggestive that there's some increased intracranial pressure. A decreased RI, which is due to um, generally due to high diastolic flow, is due to intrauterine asphyxia, growth retardation, elevated heart rate, and decreased cardiac output. So intrauterine asphyxia is thought to show 
this very high diastolic flow, which would be evidenced by a high diastolic flow across here, and that's related to cerebral reperfusion after the asphyxial insult. So the mastoid fontanelle view, which is extremely important to do because it's really the only way where you can really look at the posterior fossa. The fontanelle is located at the junction of the squamosal, lamboidal and occipital sutures. So it's just here. The probe is held um, with the point going superior and the other point going inferior. So this is the posterior fossa view. Here is your cerebellum. Here is your cisterna magna, and if you angle the beam more towards the eyes, you will see the fourth ventricle come into play, and if you angle it more inferiorly, you'll see the folia of the cerebellar hemispheres. Many people measure the cerebellar, transcerebellar distance, and you take the maximal point just posterior to the fourth ventricle, where you get nice clear margins of the cerebellum and the measurement should be almost consistent with their gestation up to about 32 weeks and there are well recognized nomograms that you can use to relate their cerebellar diameter to their gestation. Just looking at the cerebellum and looking at the transcerebellar diameter. These are the atria of the ventricles which you can see in this mastoid fontanelle view. Ventricular measurements have been used and there is generally a standard way of measuring them. So the anterior horn width is measured at the level of the insula where it is completely equal and you measure at the, post, at the parallel area of the anterior horn width at the level of the roof of the third ventricle with the corpus callosum. Then you can do the thalamo-occipital distance which you should have the full ventricle as a C and you measure from the area that is perpendicular to the line that goes through the maximal bit of the occipital horn to the thalamus, including the choroid plexus. The third ventricle is measured in the transfontanelle, lateral fontanelle view where this is thalamus, this is thalamus, and then you measure from internal margin to internal margin, and it should be less than two millimeters. And the fourth ventricle is measured in the fat mastoid fontanelle view, measuring base and the height, and that should be less than 10 millimeters in all views. So ventricular measurements. We're at the level of the insula, we're at the level of the roof of the third ventricle with the choroid plexus, and we're measuring for the most parallel margins of the anterior horns, and this is where you measure the anterior horn width at the level of the corpus callosum. Obviously, this baby's a little bit got a small corpus callosum. The thalamo-occipital distance, we generally try and make a mark to try and get a parallel, a perpendicular line to the widest edge of the um, occipital horn, and then you measure to the thalamus, including the choroid plexus. So this is the thalamo-occipital distance. This is the third ventricular measurement, which is taken through the lateral fontanelle, which is a, a found above the ear in a parallel plane along the line from the eye to the ear. And then you will see um, thalamus, thalamus, foramen of Munro, and this is the third ventricle. And then the third ventricle should be less than two millimeters if it is normal. I've chosen a dilated one here to demonstrate how to measure the third ventricle. The foramen magnum view is frequently used when you want to look at the cisterna magna and see if there's any cord compression. So we're basically we're trying to look up through this hole in the base of the skull. So the neck needs to be flexed a little bit, obviously not enough to occlude their airway, and you slide an angle towards the anterior fontanelle so that you can see the pons, the medulla, the cisterna magna, the, and the cerebellum. So this is the foramen view. So we're coming up here. We can see the spinal cord, the epigenic line of the spinal cord. We can see the vertebrae, and we can start seeing the medulla and looking up to the pons, and we can see a generous cisterna magna. This is in, um, trying to define the anatomy. So we've got the cisterna magna here. We've got the, the cervical cord. 
you have the inferior vermis of the brain stem in this particular image. This is the vestigial point, the fourth ventricle. This is the superior vermis. This is the foramen magnum. This is the medulla, and then you're going up to the pons. Gyral development is also very important for neonatal ultrasound scan because gyral development post-growth is not as equivalent to it is in the fetus. It is about two weeks behind. So you can often look at an infant and you can get some assessment as to their gestation. So the gyral development is generally looking at the um, how, feature, how many features of gyral development, primary, tertiary, and secondary branching. So it tends to be featureless at 24 weeks and less, um, and less. it's widely gaping calcarine, insuline, and post-exhibital fissures. 28 to 30 weeks, you get primary branching, and 36 weeks, you get secondary branching, and 38 weeks, you get tertiary branching. I tend to just look at the singular sulcus, um, and so it should be discontinuous at 24 weeks, continuous line at 26 weeks, the first branch of the primary sulcus at 32 weeks, multiple branches at 34 weeks, and then you get this cobblestone appearance at 38 weeks. So this is looking at the cingulate sulcus. This is pretty discontinuous. This is an infant who's 24 weeks or less. Then you start to see the cingulate sulcus showing some branching. So this is primary branching and perhaps a little bit of secondary branching. So we're now looking at an infant who's 32 to 34 weeks. And then this is your term infant, multiple branching of the cingulate sulcus. Interventricular hemorrhage. So interventricular hemorrhage is generally being classified in the papule classification of grade 1, 2, 3, and 4. Whilst this is not a perfect classification, I thought it best to sort of use this classification because I think it's the one that most people use. But there is some plans for um, the ANZNN neonatal database collection group to actually move away from this very simple classification of hemorrhages. Um, but until that becomes universally accepted, I think we'll just go through the usual papule classification. So you have a grade one, which is confined to the subependymal and the germinal matrix. A grade two, there should be blood noted within the ventricular lumen. And the best way of seeing this is by using the posterior fontanelle view. Grade three is an interventricular hemorrhage with ventricular dilatation. And a grade four is interventricular hemorrhage with parenchymal hemorrhagic infarction. How good is ultrasound at looking at hemorrhages? Well, it's pretty good. Um, for a germinal matrix hemorrhage, it's about 61% and specificity is 78%. This is compared to MRI and CT scans. The diagnosis of interventricular hemorrhage, when you're talking about a grade two, you get higher sensitivity and specificity. And parenchymal hemorrhage, there's a reasonably high sensitivity and specificity. So it's pretty good. It's not perfect, but um, it's reliable, you can repeat it easily, and you have a reasonable sensitivity and specificity. Okay, so this is the germinal matrix, it's bulky, there's an increased area of echogenicity, there's bulging into the hemorrhage, into the ventricle, this is a grade one. This is an also a grade one in the coronal plane, you've got some bulging into the ventricle, but the ventricle is not dilated. It's only four millimeters. This is also a grade one. This is a, um, an infant with an interventricular hemorrhage. And then when you look down below, you can see there's a large amount of occipital horn hemorrhage. So this is a grade two. It looks like a grade one on the coronal, but if you go to the sagittal plane, it's a grade two. This is another way of looking at grade twos. You can see the, the hemorrhage in the occipital horn. This is the posterior fontanelle view. So you come into the posterior fontanelle and you can actually see that there's a hemorrhage that has layered and fallen into the occipital lobe. This is a grade three. You have ventricular dilatation and you have hemorrhage that is generally filling up more than 50% of the ventricle. This is a grade three. You have ventricular dilatation. These ventricles are dilated. This is always really difficult. It was a grade three hemorrhage, or was it a grade two? And I think it's really important to say, is this a, what is the initial point of hemorrhage? So the initial hemorrhage is what the hemorrhage should be classified. And then if you have post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, I think you should say it's a grade two with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, or it's a grade three with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. 
So this infant we felt had a grade three and has now developed, gone on to develop post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. So this is measuring the Levine measurement. So you measure the widest point of the ventricle, the interhemorrhagic fissure. This measures the uh, anterior horn width and including all of the hemorrhage. So this is an infant who's actually um, having interventricular hemorrhage whilst we're doing the scan. And as you can see, the blood is um, moving around. You get micro streaming, and you're seeing the streaming of the blood cells as our, um, the baby is crying and the pressure is changing within the um, ventricle. We have post-hemorrhagic hemorrhage. One of the things that people frequently do is they want to do lumbar punctures to see if they can reduce the ventricular dilation. One of the things that you can use is you can use pulse Doppler to see is there CSF flow. So if you look here, you've got arterial flow. But if you look very carefully at the third ventricle going into the fourth ventricle, when the baby cries or a little bit of pressure is exerted on the anterior fontanelle, you can actually see low flow coming through the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. And so we use this to help us decide whether lumbar punctures are likely to be successful. This is obviously a grade four. So you've got a large grade three on the right, and you've got parenchymal extension in this fan-shaped fan area, area. Uh, in the parenchyma. This is also periventricular peri echogenicity. Um, and so this is in a sagittal plane, extensive periventricular echogenicity. It's not as bright as bone, but as we watch that, that will develop into um, cystic periventricular leukomalacia. This is an arterial infarct. It's quite wide. It's in a circular area, and the MRI confirmed that it was actually an arterial infarct. There's no associated interventricular hemorrhage. So this is an isolated parenchymal echogenicity associated with interventricular hemorrhage. And so therefore, it's an arterial infarct, not a periventricular infarct. So grade, four, um, grade fours are uh, thought to be related to obstruction of the terminal veins of the um, uh, terminal veins which lie on the inferior side of the ventricle, and uh, that occlusion of those inferior veins causes the venous infarct. So once again, you have a large hemorrhage with echogenicity, and this would be a grade four. This is something that we all want to avoid, which is um, periventricular leukomalacia. So this is um, breakdown of the parenchyma, um, secondary to complete infarct. And you gradually see all these cysts forming. And this is a gradual meltdown of the whole brain. Extensive cystic periventricular leukomalacia. Bilateral periventricular leukomalacia is associated with a 60 to 70% chance of cerebral palsy and a 50% chance of um, developmental delay less than an IQ of 80. So it's a really important thing to diagnose. And obviously, if this is as gross as this, it's quite easy. But sometimes it's relatively um, small. And these cysts appear um, six weeks after the injury that has caused them, and then they disappear later on. OK, so now going into other cysts that you can see in the um, brain. I think this is the one that causes a lot of people quite a bit of problem. This is a right paraventricular cyst. So these are now actually called connatal cysts. The old terminology for them was paraventricular cysts. If these cysts are in the inferior margin of the lateral ventricle and they are anterior to the foramen of Munro, these have been followed up in long-term studies and they are not associated with any long-term disability and they are insignificant finding in terms of long-term outcome. They gradually disappear by the time the child is six months and the actual etiology of them is not completely known. But they are small cysts that are found in the inferior margin of the ventricle. Are they related to perhaps a small hemorrhage that's now resolving that happened in utero? I don't think that's likely. I think it's most likely related to germinal matrix lysis and loss of the germinal matrix, which in the fetus is actually in the anterior horn. Then going on to the mastoid fontanelle view, you can actually see quite a significant hemorrhage. And this is really the best way of seeing 
a posterior fossa hemorrhage in the cerebellum. So the, there are many studies which have looked at the anterior fontanel view versus the mastoid fontanel view. And Catherine Limperopoulos has shown quite clearly that unless you use the mastoid fontanel view, you are really going to miss quite a few cerebellar hemorrhages. So this is a cerebellar hemorrhage. It's generally circular and it's best seen by using the mastoid fontanel view. Everything that's echogenic is not uh, a hemorrhage. So this is once again using the mastoid fontanel view and this is an echogenic uh, lesion which was found to be in the fourth ventricle and it actually has blood flow and MRI confirmed that this was a hemangioma um, that was growing and so obviously the concern was that there would be an obstructive hydrocephalus developed. Okay, this is the MRI and it confirmed that it was a uh, hemangioma. I think extraaxial bleeds. Extraaxial bleeds are really difficult um, on ultrasound and I think it's often very difficult to be clear whether it's an epidural, a subdural or a subarachnoid um, hemorrhage. But they can be seen and with careful investigation and sweeping to the side of the skulls you can actually see extraaxial bleeds. But generally they can be quite big. Um, so I think MRI they're looking for extraaxial bleeds. But we will just go through them again. So epidural bleeding generally causes from trauma and it's lentiform with the convex surface away from the skull. The subdural and the subarachnoid actually occurs within normal deliveries, about 3 to 18% of all deliveries according to CT scans that were done in the late 80s. Um, and um, uh, obviously most of these are asymptomatic. And then you can get quite symptomatic subarachnoid hemorrhages as resulting from birth trauma. Okay, I think the most important thing is to see is there midline shift? Is there a generalized increase in echogenicity of the parenchyma suggesting that there is hypoxic injury associated with this um, uh, extraaxial bleed? So things to look for. So this is an extraaxial bleed. I think it's very difficult to appreciate here, but this side is not the same as the other and there is a hemorrhage located in the temporal horn. This is also an extraaxial bleed. You've got increased echogenicity. The cortex has been pushed away from the bone and you've got a thickening of the hippocampal gyri. So this is blood layering around the bone and on the temporal horn. This one here is also very difficult to see, but this is a tentorial bleed. It's quite a circular area, best seen in the mastoid fontanelle view. And this was also confirmed on MRI to be a tentorial bleed. A genesis of the corpus callosum is quite um, is frequently seen, and it is important. I think the reason to talk about it is that sometimes you can be confused with a lipoma and think that the corpus callosum is there. So the fibers of the corpus callosum arise from the superficial layers of the cerebral cortex, and they are meant to cross from the left to the right. With the um, with a genesis of the corpus callosum, these fibers instead of crossing from left to right go longitudinally and they form the bundles of cross. Okay, so this is a genesis of the corpus callosum. So you've got the sun ray spine, you've got the gyri coming all the way to the midline, coming all the way to the tectal plate, and then you have a small lipoma that is in the um, area where the corpus callosum would normally be. You often have a high riding third ventricle associated with a genesis of the corpus callosum. And then you sometimes can have this typical staghorn appearance with an interhemispheric cyst, and here's your third ventricle that's also associated with the um, agenesis of the corpus callosum. Everything that's cystic is not um, uh, a cyst or filled with just fluid. As we can see, this is an arterial venous malformation. So it's important whenever you see anything cystic in the brain to put on color flow to confirm what the flow is doing. And everything that's echogenic is not always pathological. So this is lenticular striate artery echogenicity. And this is um, of unknown origin. It's really not clear what causes this. It's very commonly seen in the preterm infant when they're gradually getting towards term. And I think the most important thing to know is that lenticular striate artery echogenicity is really not associated with any significant long-term outcome issues for the preterm infant. It has no good correlation with long-term development. 
In utero, when you see lenticular striate artery echogenicity, people are concerned that it's related to in utero infection and it's always checked for. But when it's seen postnatally in the day 30, day 60 scan, it is of less significance. You can confirm that this is an artery by putting on your pulse Doppler and you can see that this is filled with low flow, low amplitude, low velocity um, flow and you can confirm that this is lenticular striate artery echogenicity and that the flow um, is still occurring in those vessels. Okay, I think that's all about heads and we'll go on to the spinal ultrasound. Spinal ultrasound, I was mainly going to focus on the fact that there are many infants that are born with a sacral dimple and frequently we are asked to scan infants for this sacral dimple. And so reading the literature, it became quite clear that a lot of the sacral dimples do not need to be scanned and are not associated with spinal abnormalities. I think with the increasing advent of antenatal scans, the use of folate acid antenatally, the, the value of skin pigmentation and this simple sacral dimple um, as an indicator of an underlying occult spinal problem is becoming less. So dimples are now broken up into a simple dimple or a dimple that needs to be scanned. So a simple dimple is less than 2.5 centimetres away from the anus. There's no associated hair or skin pigmentation. These lesions do not need to be scanned. There's some reference on the next slide. A sexual dimple that is greater than 2.5 centimetres away from the anus has got a pigmented spinal lesion or there's raised fatty cystic lesion. Well, yeah, those lesions do need to be scanned. And these are the people who have looked at um, occult spinal dysracism um, in relation to sacral dimples that have come out with this new recommendation that that simple coccygeal dimple that's um, 2.5 centimetres or, or less um, from the anus is a simple coccygeal dimple or simple sacral dimple and is really not associated with underlining occult spinal dysracism. Okay, the technique. Obviously you want the neonate to be comfortable or prone on the side. A linear array of the highest frequency available should be used and using that field of view scanning can really give you a nice long image of the spine. It's, um, you can count by two ways. You can identify T12 and then count down or you can identify S1 and then count up. The cord should finish at L2 which is the conus medullaris and then you should visualize the filament terminale and you tend to use M mode to document movement of the cord. Okay, so this is the cord finishing at L1, L2, so it's important to label your spine. Here's your, your conus and here's your terminal fil filamale. So this is a um, normal cord, so here's your conus filling and here's your terminus. And this is a way of counting, so you can count from your sacrum, so it's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, so this is S1, and then the next one's L5, and you can count back, and you see it by the angulation that is caused from the sacrum back to the um, lumbar spine. This is using M mode to see movement of your spine. And this is a spinal cord which is showing no movement whatsoever. Here's the echogenic center and there is no movement with breathing and so therefore this infant has a fixed cord. This is a low line cord, so there you've got your closest, this um, filling is finishing below L3 and so these are your vertebral bodies. This is your um, conus and this is your filament. And this is also another image of a low-lying cord. Some people look at the sickle dimple, see if there's a cystic connection that they can follow down to the terminal and down to the spinal cord. This is the a transverse image of a low-lying cord. You've got the echogenic center and then the spinal cord, your, your subdural space, and that is um, um, documented in L4 or L5. This is using this long field of view and as you can see in this instance there is a cyst at the end of the turn at the end 
the final cord so this is our normal it is very low line and it is hitting onto one Y. Okay, so um, thank you very much for listening. These are the references, the other spinal cord references were listed uh, previously. Um, and um, do you have any questions? Over to you, Claire. Hello, Claire. Thank you for that. So we'll now open up to any questions that have been received. So just a reminder, if you do have any questions, you can submit them via the questions pane. So the first question we got, what was the new name for the paraventricular cyst again? Um, so that is called connatal cyst, C-O-N hyphen N-A-T-A-L, connatal cyst. So basically, just the first cyst. The next question was, are there normal measurements for the supracellar cistern? Um, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't investigated that or done normal measurements for the supracellar cistern. I'm sorry, I'd need to, to uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That's a very good question, thank you for answering that. Are there normal measurements for sutures when assessing cranial synchronization? I need to have treatment and look for to, so really you want wanting to know it is um, three so three or grade three and over ten millimeters you start being saying that 
you need treatment to relieve this in, um, ventricular dilation. When you get a preterm infant that is 60 to 90 days of age, people also measure the anterior horn width. And what they have found is if your anterior horn width is greater than 6 millimeters, millimeters is not three associated with six years post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, but these ventricles are just getting bigger to fill up the space of brain that has not been growing. The bigger and bigger ventricles are over six millimeters, the higher the incidence of long term neurological motor and cord and neuro, um, neurodevelopmental delay. Um, so you have these two things, six millimeter shift, the ventricular dilation acute and related to the hemorrhage, or is it related to ex vacuo dilation? of which, once again, three millimetres is normal. Six millimetres is not thought to show any three to six millimetres is not really associated with poor or long-term outcome. But once you get greater than six millimetres, it's associated with poor or long-term outcome in the ex preterm infant. And is thought to be you know, ex vacuo dilatation in the infant who's got poor cortical growth. Great, thanks for that, Cheryl. The next question we have for you is why would you assess MCA versus ACA? Um, I think that um, it's a, it's, there's no difference in which one you choose. I think the anterior cerebral artery tends to be easier to teach. Um, so that's why I tend to use the anterior cerebral artery versus, versus the middle cerebral artery. Um, so it's a matter of preference, which one you find easiest to get. The middle cerebral artery is where most people have done the research in looking at uh, in, in for infants who have got hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and looking for that high diastolic flow. And the main reason they've used that is when you actually get good at getting it, you can actually get a, um, a z almost zero degree Doppler angle. Um, so um, the middle cerebral artery, you are more likely to get repetitive results with less intraoperative interoperative and interoperative um, error. I think the anterior cerebral artery is easier for people learning, but it is um, most probably less repeatable if you're going to be using it for research and for using diagnostic uh, as a diagnostic criteria. So the middle cerebral artery, is, it's, better, it's easier to get zero degree angle, and I think that's why most people like to use it. Wonderful. All right, so we've got another question for you. What are your thoughts on newborn slash infant ultrasound for increased head circumference? Right, okay. okay. Um, I think that if a baby has crossed the centile uh, and they still have open sutures, I think a cranial ultrasound scan would be is the best way to assess those infants. Most of those infants just have a constitutionally enlarged head. And when you do the cranial ultrasound scan, what you just see is normal ventricles, no post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, no um, dilated ventricles, no big subarachnoid spaces. You just just see a normal brain. And if they, um, and I, th I think that it's a good screening tool. Um, but you know, obviously, if the infant continues to cross the centiles, you then want to go on and do further scanning. But I think as a primary um, investigation for infants with a large head um, that people are concerned about, I think that it's quite a valuable tool um, up, up to the time when the suture is closed and you can no longer get good windows. It, it's quite a reasonable tool uh, up to three months. Great, thanks for that. So the next one that's come through is the PVL is an isolated entity or related to hemorrhage? Okay, so cystic PVL is um, not an isolated en entity, um, but you can see cysts within the periventricular region, region for other reasons than associated with hemorrhage. So cystic PVL traditionally is associated with um, an interventricular hemorrhage and you've got this um, uh, periventricular echogenicity, which is related to um, infarction, and you get this breakdown of the parenchyma. Um, you can also see cystic PVL related to other entities where it is thought to be 
um, secondary to a watershed um, poor perfusion um, whilst in utero. So infants who have got severe intrauterine growth restriction um, can also get cystic periventricular leukomalacia which is unrelated to an interventricular hemorrhage. So you can sort of get the, the, the entities with a hemorrhage or the entities not related to a hemorrhage. Um, so it's not always associated with um, interventricular hemorrhage. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, the next one that's come through is more of a request. Uh, they are asking, please show references for spinal US again. Oh, sure. So these are the references for the spinal dysracism. Great. Next question we've got. Spine cyst, as described in your talk, are they a significant abnormality? Sorry, say that again. Spine cyst, as described in your talk, are they a significant abnormality? Um, yeah, so these, these, um, these cysts that you see at the base of the spine um, are generally associated with a low-lying spine and tethering of the cord and they are associated with um, a, a lower motor neuron disorders later on in life. Um, yeah, they're and they should be followed up with MRIs and followed up in a neurological clinic. Wonderful. associated with a non-mobile tethered cord. Okay, so the next question for you, Cheryl. Is there any merit in performing MCA syndrome if there is no obvious abnormality? Um, I don't think there's any value. I mean, the value of um, middle secondary Doppler is um, the main use of it is in babies with hypoxic encephalopathy. So you're looking to see if they've got fusion injury. The second way, the second reason to look at your middle cerebral arteries is if you think that you um, have an infant with a stroke, and some people have documented seeing poor middle cerebral artery flow on the affected side, as you might see in a in a MRA. Um, the um, third reason for uh, looking at the middle cerebral artery would be looking for raised intracranial pressure, and I think if there is no clinical indication or clinical signs for that, you may choose not to look for middle cerebral artery Doppler um, in an infant. If the infant is just coming to you because they've got a big head but it's not really crossing centiles and there's no other clinical signs with it, I wouldn't have thought that it was an essential thing to do. I'm not quite sure what information it would help you with. Okay, great. Next question, is it true that the CSP has often disappeared by three months? Yes. Yeah, so the cavum septum pellucidum um, can, can disappear and it's not always visible all the time. Yep. Yeah. Next question, have you ever seen an indication for small anterior frontal for a two-day-old baby? Sorry, so I think you're asking, would you actually do an ultrasound because there's a small anterior fontanelle? Um, well, certainly if the, um, if the small anterior fontanelle is associated with um, the concern, are these sutures overlying or are these sutures fused? Um, yes, you would be reasonable to do an ultrasound for that and that would be one of the times that I would actually look at the sutures um, because um, you can actually tell um, are the sutures open or closed. You might not be able to define how far open they are in terms of millimetres but you can tell whether they're open or closed and you can often actually tell whether they're overlapping because there's been compression and molding during the delivery, if they, especially if they had a vaginal delivery, um, versus uh, ridging which would be associated with craniosynostosis. But if they've got a small anterior fontanelle and a normal head shape, normal head size, 
um, you would be, you know, it's not unreasonable to do an ultrasound um, to to look at that, but you'd want to have perhaps a little bit more of an indication than just the small anterior fontanelle. You'd want to have concern that the sutures were overlapping or overlying or that there um, was a small head circumference in association with the small anterior fontanelle. But you know, you get requests to do ultrasounds for lots of unusual reasons and sometimes you think, oh, why am I doing this? I don't really, you know, and then you, know, you do it and you find something. So it's often hard. If someone's asked you to do it, I often find it hard to say, no, I'm not going to do it or there's no indication. Great. Um, just as a, we're getting a lot of questions about the recording and a copy of the webinar. So just to let everyone know in one go that the webinar is being recorded and will be distributed after. So if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And thank you again, Cheryl, for the presentation. We hope you all enjoy the remainder of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, Claire.